John chapter 4. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and, dis- and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. So notice Jesus wasn't actually baptizing. He had his disciples doing it. And this is just good leadership. Good leaders do not micromanage. Good leaders know how to delegate. Delegate authority, delegate jobs. And if we want to be good leaders ourselves, man, we look to the greatest leader there ever was and ever will be, Jesus himself. So he's on his way back to Galilee where he did his first miracle, and he needed to go through Samaria, verse 4, which is going to be about a three days journey. Then he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied in his journey, sat on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So sixth hour on the Jewish time clock is noon, and they start that at 6 a.m., 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, which is noon. On the Roman clock, the sixth hour would be 6 a.m. naturally. So here it is, high noon. The sun's in the sky. He's hot. He's tired. And there came a woman of Samaria to draw water at the well. Now, one thing you need to learn about Samaria and the Samaritans is that Jesus wasn't sent to the non-Jew at the time. He wasn't sent to the Gentile. A Gentile is a non-Jew. He was missioned to go, commissioned to go to the the Jews first. And it says that in Matthew 15, 24, you can read that Jesus answered a non-Jew at the time. And he said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When he sent him out in Matthew chapter 10, he sent him out specifically. He told them, do not go into the way of the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans do not enter, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why am I saying this? And is it even important? Absolutely, it is important. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jesus was sent to the Jew. Much of his writings, much of what he was saying was written to the Jew primarily. And if you don't understand that, and if you don't under, if you don't know that many times you could be, you could be taking to heart what he's saying to you. And it wasn't to you uh, unless you're Jewish, but it's specifically, you got to understand what the author is trying to say and what Jesus is trying to say. And you got to get it in context. Very important. Now, Jesus, in this situation, encounters this Samarian woman, a Samaritan woman, which is kind of um, almost half Jewish and half non-Jewish, but they were, Jews and, and Samaritans were at odds. They butted heads. They didn't really have any dealings with each other, which is, we're going to see that in a second. So here's Jesus breaking the barriers, and he, he, she's getting something to drink out of this well. Verse 7, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said unto her, give me something to drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy meat. So just in him asking this question to the Samaritan woman, first of all, men and women, women were really the underdogs back in the day, more than now ever. And the other thing is, she's not Jewish. And if you remember in the 60s, in America, they had different water fountains. One water fountain would be for white folks and water, one water fountain would be for black folks. And you really weren't supposed to drink out of um, the one if you weren't white or, or, or whatever the case. And here's Jesus really obliterating that kind of rule of thumb. She even asked, then says the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that you being a Jew asked something to drink of me, which is a Samaritan. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So she's acknowledging, hey, we we shouldn't be talking. Why are you even talking to me? And Jesus, I just love it. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that says to you, give me something to drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. So here's Jesus breaking racial barriers and asking her the question, 
give me something to drink. Can you, you're, you're getting, you're drawing water. Can you get something for me? And she's like, wow, what are you doing talking to me? And he says, his answer is really mind blowing. If you knew who was asking you, you'd be asking him. And he would have given you the drink that would have forever quenched your thirst. He would have given you living water. Now, I want to talk about this living water just for a second. What is this living water? First of all, it's something that Jesus describes as something that would quench your thirst forever. In John chapter 7, in the last day, verse 37, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So Jesus is offering her something something amazing, something awesome, something that's like fresh, not even out of the box yet. I'm offering you, you'd be asking for me and I would give you living water. And the other thing about this question, I think, and, and the way he answers and responds to her, I mean, imagine if you're in this situation and you come up to somebody and, and they say, hey, give me something to drink. And you say, whoa, why are you talking to me? And they said, if, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking for me and I would give you the drink and it would be, it would blow your mind and quench your thirst. Honestly, I would probably take that person as maybe even a little arrogant. Um, who do you think you are? Well, the woman has a similar response. She says unto him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. From where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave you, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? I mean, it's kind of like, who do you think you are? But Jesus explains to her, whoever drinks of this water from the well shall thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life, which is the similar language we have over in John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. This type of water here, physical water, you're going to get thirsty again. But this spiritual water I'm talking about will forever quench your thirst. This is going to be the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which is, which is about to happen, which all believers um, get and need to be baptized with. And she's starting to get it. In verse 15, the woman says unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go, call your husband and come, come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and he whom you have now is not your husband. In that you said truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, Jesus is flowing in the word of knowledge and the, the word of wisdom here, and he is reading her mail. He's operating, you know, with the gifts of the Spirit, and he, realize, he says to this woman, he invites her to get this water, and he says, go get your husband. And she, she says, I'm not married. And he says, you're right, but you are shacking up with this woman. You are in, you are shacking up with this man. You are in a sexual relationship with this man, and it's not something that has been authorized. So let's talk about that for just a second. Cohabitation, which means a, a person, two people living together, not married, but they're engaged in sec sexual relations. Is that right or wrong? Well, the Bible calls it fornication. And fornication is basically sex, any kind of sexual relation outside of marriage. So what is Jesus saying here about marriage? Jesus is basically saying, you aren't married to this man. Even though you're in a relationship with this man, this is not marriage. A marriage, a civil ceremony, a marriage ceremony where, where there's vows exchanged and, and before witnesses and before God, that's what constitutes marriage. I mean, this is something that God instituted in the first place. So it's something that, that really, if he's the designer and the author of marriage, then we kind of need to submit to his, his ways of marriage. So she recognizes that he's, 
he's a prophet. She recognized me. Hey, you must be a prophet. I mean, you're, you're telling me about my life and things that nobody knows. And then she flips the uh, discussion a little bit on its head. And she says in verse 20, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So he starts getting personal with her and she decides to kind of dodge the question a little bit here and talks about where people ought to worship. And I've, I've talked to people before and, and they, you start going a little bit deeper and you start getting tender, you start getting into the nitty gritty and some people can't always handle that. And here's this woman dodging the question. She starts to talk about the geography of worship. Hey, you know, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, but you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus brings it right back. He says to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you shall neither worship in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the father. In other words, it won't matter where you worship. You worship what you know. You worship what you know not. We worship what we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what is going on here? She, he meets this woman at the well. This woman is, he, he brings this natural, completely normal um, encounter on a regular, this is so regular. This is so just a generic, all of a sudden it becomes this powerful, powerful account. And I'm so glad that it's recorded because forever and ever it can now affect people and it affected her life. It affected minis. We're going to, we're going to see that in a second, but she's talking and having an encounter with Jesus. And if you've ever had an encounter with him, it goes way beyond the surface. And she she starts talking to him about, well, we need to worship, we need to do these things, and she starts to get technical, and he says, listen, worship, worship is of the Jews, salvation is of the Jews, and the hour comes and now is when, when the true worshipers, the true people of God, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That is what the Father is looking like. That's what the Father is looking for. And if you remember in John chapter one, one of the things I talked about is Jesus and his, his, his purpose here. One of the things that he wanted to do is reveal the heart of the father. He came to put a face on God. He came to demonstrate God and who God is and what he's really like. And here in verse 23, he says, that's what the father is looking for. If the father is looking for anything, he's looking for worshipers to worship him the right way in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him or connect with him on his plane in spirit and in truth. You can't get to God uh, through Bluetooth technology. You can't get to God on some other level of technology. God is a spirit and so you've got to go and worship him and connect with him through in, in the spiritual way, through the Holy Spirit, through the spirit. So he's breaking these things down to her and she's probably opening her heart and she's probably, her spiritual hunger is probably um, opening up a little bit. Verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto you am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with this woman. See, even they were like, wow, he's talking to a woman, number one, and she's a Samaritan. But yet no man said, what are, you, what are you seeking or what are you looking for? Or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Isn't this the Christ? See, an encounter with Jesus, it, it breaks the surface it goes deeper. It goes into the heart. This is what the Word of God does. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. And if you remember earlier, we were talking about the Word of God, which is Jesus, Hebrews 4.12, is alive. 
and active and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing in two of soul and spirit and the joints of marrow and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Jesus gets to the thoughts and intents of the heart like no other. Here he is ministering to this woman, gets to the thoughts and intents of her heart, and she is just, her jaw is dropping. She's drooling. She's just like, I, I, I leave my water. She left her water pot. She goes back to the city and she starts telling everybody. And if you've had a real encounter with the Lord, it's hard to keep it to yourself. In fact, if you were to keep it to yourself and, and feel like it's something personal, I remember meeting someone one time and they said, oh, it's very personal. I, you know, you don't, you shouldn't talk about these things, but it's not, it's, it's personal, but a city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. And men do not light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick so that it gives light to all that are in the room. Matthew chapter five, verse 14 and 15. This is what happens when you rub up against the light of the world, when you meet the living water, when you, when you have an encounter with Jesus, you can't help but want to share it. Then verse 30, they went out of the city and came to Jesus, came to him. In the meantime, while his disciples asked him, prayed him saying, master, eat. But he said to them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. What's he talking about here? I have meat to eat that you know not of. The disciples didn't know what he's talking about. Many times Jesus would speak in these spiritual metaphors and these guys were carnal. They just weren't getting them. And the disciples said one to another, did anybody feed? Did anybody bring him something to eat? And then Jesus explains a little bit. He says unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. What is he saying here? He says, you guys don't know nothing about this. Don't know nothing about what? What he was just doing in ministering to this woman at the well was the will of the father that sent him. This was the work that God came to do. This is the work that Jesus was was trying to do. He was trying to reveal the father to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and to, and ultimately the world. And when you do that, as he was doing here, it is sustaining, it is satisfying. It is something that really gives you joy and keeps you alive and gives you energy. This is what natural food does. Natural food is enjoyable. It tastes good. It, it, it strengthens you. Well, here's Jesus after he ministered to this, this woman and he's just sitting there basking in what had just happened. And I'm sure he feels fulfilled. When you, when you do the will of God, it's very life-giving. And we see this on display. And they didn't really get it. And he says, well, my food, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Well, there's another point of what he is sent to do. He says in John 5, 17, but my father works up until now and I work. Jesus is, was here doing the work of the father. And in 1930 of John, when he was on the cross, he says, it is finished. And then he gives up the ghost. So he was doing the will of the father and doing work that God had him to do. And he finished it. And thank God it's finished. However, Jesus passes the baton to his 12 disciples, and they in turn pass it down to you and me. And that's the bigger picture of what's going on here in John chapter 4. Jesus has these guys in training. He wants them to know that one day I'm going to pass this thing down to you. In fact, he says in verse 35, don't say there are yet four more months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest. He says, don't, don't say, oh, we'll, we'll get to it down the road four more months and then there's going to be a harvest. He says, right under our noses, there's opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And he had just gotten through demonstrating that with this woman at the well and ministering to her. And now, my gosh, there's people, honestly, people were probably on their way down to see him. And who knows, it could have been the moment when they were walking and coming, getting ready to surround him that he says, look up, look on the fields. They're, they're ready for the harvest. 
Look at all these people. People. God cares about people. And he continues with this, this cool analogy of, of sowing and reaping. Verse 36, And he that reaps rece- receives wages and gathers fruit unto eternal life, that both he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice together. You see, one sows and another reaps, and we're all on God's team, but God brings the increase. You see, Paul said it this way over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So, the, so neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters anything special, but God that gives the increase. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. What's he saying there? He's saying exactly what Jesus is saying, that that the one who sows and the one who reaps, they both rejoice together. Verse 37, and herein is that saying true. One sows, another reaps, and I sent you to reap whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you have entered into their labors. Well, who's he talking about there? Well, he's talking about the prophets before him who have already spoken the word of God and people were already becoming prepared for a savior to come on the scene. You know, they probably wouldn't have been able to handle it had Jesus come at a different time and a different age. I wonder sometimes if Jesus came on the scene, uh, you know, why didn't, why didn't God send Jesus earlier? But the truth is it wasn't the right time. It says in Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. There was proper timing. Here was Jesus Christ coming on the scene right in the middle of the harvest. The harvest was ripe, and Jesus says, hey, lift up your eyes. Good things are happening. Get, get on board with what God is doing. Follow me. Verse 39, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all things that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them or stay with them. So he stayed there two more days and many more believed because of his own word and said to the woman, now we believe not because of your saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the savior of the world. So this is awesome stuff. People are coming to the same realization that Peter came to when they say, man, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the savior. We are convinced of this. And that, knowing that makes all the difference. Verse 43. Now, after two days, he departed from there and went into Galilee, which he was originally trying to go to. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Then when he had come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went to the feast. So Jesus came again into into Cana of Galilee, where he had turned water into wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he had heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said unto him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The noble man said unto him, Sir, come down, or else my child is going to die. So we have this nobleman who's got a sick son at the point of death, and he has some faith here because he, he goes and gets Jesus and says, Hey, can you come down and heal my son? And But Jesus' response here, so back to the statement when he says, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. This is not directed at necessarily directly at the nobleman. It's really directed at the people, to the people of Galilee. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Because the Samaritans in the context, had just believed, and they really didn't see signs and wonders. They just got a word of 
prophecy, prophecy, and they just went and and heard his word. But and it's not wrong to need to see miracles and wonders. In fact, we need to. There needs to be miracles and signs and wonders in ministry in general, because we're dealing with a miraculous God who loves to perform miracles. In fact, if there's none in our lives, then there should be flags. We, there should be concerns. But also notice signs and wonders um, really help people believe. I mean, it's hard to disregard when somebody is healed of a disease. It's hard to just totally ignore God in those, in those times. But this nobleman did have faith. He did have some faith at least. And he says, son, he says, sir, come down or else my child die. So he does have faith in calling on Jesus here. But Jesus says to him, go your way, your son lives. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and he went his way. Now, this man going on his way, this was quite a journey that he had to go back and and meet his dying son. And I'm sure that he had doubts. I'm sure that he had fears, but he was hanging on these words, go your way, your son lives. He was hanging on words that came from the master's mouth and refused to doubt. And look what happened. As he was now going down, his servants met him and told him saying, your son lives. Then he inquired of the hour He inquired of them the actual hour when he began to amend or get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So right when the the father knew, the father believed is when he started getting better, which is, man, if we could just see what was going on in the spiritual realm, but time, we have to operate with time out here, but in the spiritual realm, time is really not an issue. It's only an issue on our plane of existence. But when Jesus spoke the word, that young boy was healed and it just took a matter of time for that healing to kick in fully. And faith was on display here and it's an awesome miracle. Verse 53, so the father knew that it was at that same hour in which Jesus said unto him, your son lives and he himself believed and his whole house. This again is the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. It's very important to hold on to the word of God. And really, I just want to encourage you, you don't need much faith. You just need the faith of of a mustard seed. The issue is doubt. If you can believe like a child and get that doubt and that double-mindedness out of here and just hold fast those words, the words of the master, those red letter words, you will see the manifestation of your miracle because that is what faith does. Faith, Hebrews chapter 11, verse one says, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of the unseen. Faith, what a powerful thing. To me, faith, what it does is it it bridges, it brings the 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 realities of heaven into actualities on this earth. And in this case, there's healing in heaven available and the nobleman believed for his son to receive the healing available. And when he received it and believed by faith, that that healing manifested itself and, and showed up in this earth and brought God glory. Or you could say, more appropriately, manifested forth his glory in this miracle. Same type of terminology as in John chapter 2.